Alexander the Great was undoubtedly one of the greatest generals of all time. He forged a vast empire by cunningly conquering his neighbors through conquests and alliances. The power of his army lay in their formation, discipline, and of course Alexander's leadership. His troops formed the powerful Macedonian phalanx. This wall of mobile spears proved to be the most superior of the time and won many battles. But the individual men that made up his armies were not really athletic specimens. By today's standards and compared to some of their enemies, the Greeks were actually quite small. Alexander himself was only about 5 feet in height while his troops averaged about 5 foot 6. You will see online that Alex was of average height for his time, but this is wrong. He was several inches shorter. Even so, he had a reputation for being a fearsome warrior in battle. He was notorious for leading his cavalry and was injured on many occasions. The people of antiquity were on average shorter, and this was mainly due to a lack of nutrition. But this didn't stop some groups from being much taller. When Alexander was relatively new to power, he took the task of conquering the barbarians to the north. The Celts of the Danube and Adriatic Sea region were much larger than their southern counterparts. They averaged between six and six and a half feet tall. Not giants by today's standards, but huge for the time. The historian Arian wrote that Alexander, hoping to hear his own name, asked these people to name their greatest fear. That the sky might fall on our heads came the booming reply. But even these people of great stature couldn't match the military genius that was Alexander. Perhaps out of an insecurity for the size of his own men, Alexander once ordered his blacksmiths to forge special weapons and equipment that far exceeded the normal size and weight. He then left these huge items in his camps around the countryside to frighten the populace. Another instance of giants came when Alexander was campaigning through India. It occurred when he ran into the mighty King Porus of India. The Macedonian king and his army were awestruck at the size of the Indian king. According to Alexander's biographer Plutarch, the monarch's great size and powerful physique made him appear as suitably mounted on an elephant as an ordinary man looked mounted on a horse. At nearly seven feet tall, Porus truly did tower over Alexander and his men. He also actually did ride a fittingly large Asian elephant about 11 feet tall at the shoulder. His vast army of 35,000 also comprised of 200 war elephants. But in a strange land where the rain never seemed to stop against a rival king and his beasts, Alexander's men feared little. With his bold leadership, his army crossed a monsoon swollen river to catch the army off guard. The long and bloody battle caused many casualties on both sides. When the phalanx met the war elephants, many were impaled on their steel-clad tusks. Others were trampled or thrown into the air. But the infantry resisted. Javelins and arrows were thrown into the eyes of the beasts while other troops chopped their legs with large two-handed axes. The elephants were controlled by their mahouts, who also threw javelins and arrows at enemy troops. Many of them were struck down by Macedonian projectiles. Typically, once the elephant was panicked, they would then kill their mounts with poisoned rods. But with no one on top of them, they then went on rampages through Greek and Indian forces. The phalanx then reorganized and pressed the Indians back as the Macedonian cavalry attacked their rear in a hammer and anvil maneuver. The Indian army then routed and was picked off. Throughout the battle, Alexander is said to have observed with growing admiration the valor of Porus, and understood that Porus intended to die in combat rather than be captured. A rather brave deed compared to most kings of the era. Hoping to save the life of such a competent leader and warrior, Alexander commanded Porus to surrender. However, Porus became enraged at the very sight of his nemesis and tossed a spear at him in fury without bothering to listen to his proposal. Eventually, overpowered by thirst, 
the weary Porus finally dismounted his war elephant and demanded water. After being refreshed, he allowed himself to be taken to Alexander. On hearing that the Indian king was approaching, Alexander himself rode out to meet him and the famous surrender meeting took place. He asked King Porus how he wanted to be treated, and he responded, Like a king, of course. He respected his request and gave him command of his former kingdom as a vassal. This was a great victory for Alexander, though it was more costly than his battle at Gagamela. He lost an estimated 1,000 soldiers. The Indians, however, lost around 10,000 men with another 9,000 captured. 80 war elephants were captured and another 70 came in as reinforcements and were taken. That means Alexander's men killed about 120 war elephants. Alexander wished to push through India, but upon approaching the borders of the Nanda Empire, his men feared that they may soon have to face another massive Indian army. With growing unrest, Alexander decided to give in and turn back. Unfortunately, this would be the last of his major campaigns as he would die of a mysterious illness, likely typhoid fever. At the age of 33, he had defeated his most menacing enemies and combined the beautiful cultures of Greece and the Near East. He would leave the world with no obvious successor and thus left an empire in turmoil. But his legacy would live on for eternity in our history books as being one of the greatest generals and leaders of all time. If only he hadn't died of that fever, maybe he would have used the war elephants in battle himself. We can only imagine. I wish we would learn more about this period in school, or maybe some of you did. In my history class, at least, we barely covered anything except for what has happened in the past few centuries. I think every kid should learn about the fascinating and foundational world that would influence every aspect of our culture. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, it really helps out the channel. Check out my Instagram and comment some video ideas down below. I make videos about history of humans, ancient animals, and the occasional full length documentary. If that sounds interesting, check out the over 100 videos I have made. Well, I'll see you on the next episode of Northo 2. See ya.